Welcome all the Bolton and Portland. Um, see, this is sort of the normal order of events. We normally go through some networking, some sponsor acknowledgments, um, talk about upcoming events, and then get on to the presentation. How many people for this is your first Mobile Portland? Okay, wow, a lot of people. Awesome, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Well, um, oh, okay, turn down the lights. No, Barb, I don't know how. Yeah. The last time I did that, it did not work out so well. Um, so, by the way, I'm Jason. I forgot to say that. Um, so we meet on the fourth Monday of every month. We talk about mobile topics and a variety of different topics. Every quarter we try to do one that's technical, one that's sort of business, um, like marketing, advertising, that sort of stuff, entrepreneurship, and one that's related to some sort of so change in society. So, um, you know, looking at ways in which mobile is impacting um, the world, either through augmented reality or through um, the sorts of things that we're gonna hear about today. Um, if you're interested, please sign up for the mailing list. We've got two different mailing lists. There's one that um, you can get to from mobileportland.com that's actually just an announcements list. You'll receive like two or three emails a month, very low volume. Or there's a Google group where people are oftentimes posting jobs and other things like that that may be of interest. Um, and before I forget, I wanted to thank Urban Airship for <coughs> providing the beer, providing the space, for printing the stickers that everybody's using, like helping set up the chairs, everything else that they do. So thank you, Urban Airship. <laughs> and um, a lot of people ask for uh, speakers and mics. Um, and so Gawford this month is doing that. So I want to thank the people at Gawford for doing that. Thank you. Um, they also go and get the food every month. And I thank God of that. So um, I'm so glad that they do that. Um, I want to go through some calendar of events. So we've got a lot of stuff on the website now, so you can keep up with this. Um, tonight's event, uh, this Wednesday, there's an event associated with Web Visions. Um, it's on a similar topic about the way with social media and mobile is impacting society, and it's going to look, there's a panel that's going to be talking about, so the upheaval in the Middle East, that sort of stuff. There's Voices That Matter that's going on in Seattle in April. Um, it's an iPhone developer conference. We've got an Android um, user group that meets once a month. Um, and I don't know if there's anyone from the Android group here. There usually is somebody. OK, so Jeff is uh, from the Android group if you have questions about that. The Migo group, which Don helps organize here in the front, um, meets on the 18th at Kells, correct? OK. Um, and then next month's meeting will be Demolicious. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, and then we've got a phone gap training um, coming up on May 1st. Um, continuing into May, another user group, Web Directions Unplugged, which um, got some opportunity to raffle off and for people to win free tickets, so stick around for that. Um, and which happens after that event in Mobile Northwest, um, which is the following Monday, all in Seattle, and then Web Visions as well. So I just want to highlight a couple of these because um, there's a couple of groups that are going to help out with some stuff related to Mobile Portland. So um, the guys at Natobi who do Phone Gap are actually going to help sponsor, I believe, food next month, um, something related to that. And they wanted to let people know that they've got this training coming up on May 1st, um, building stuff with Phone Gap, and rumor has it that HP may be giving away um, beers or something to people who attend that session. <laughs> That's the rumor. Uh, let's see here. Uh, web, web Directions Unplugged, as I said, if you have not entered your name, um, email address in this box, please do so, because we'll be drawing for two free registrations to this event. If you don't win that and you're interested in this event, which is um, primarily focused on web technology, um, building stuff for devices, uh, they have a code for mobile Portland people, uh, 695. And they're also interested in if enough people register or possibly like um, renting a, a coach or something like that to actually make the trip up there and like bringing people to the event and back. So if enough people be going. Um, the weekend after it, and I forgot to include this, that uh, there's also a hack day after Web Directions, so there's a lot of stuff going on there. And then I guess this conference has been going on for a while with the Mobile Mondays in Seattle, um, and it's Mobile Northwest. Um, 
conference going on the Monday after the, the Web Directions event. So if you were to head up there for that sort of uh, that event, you could make it a, a weekend. And of course, Web Visions is happening here in May. And there's a lot of good mobile speakers. So I'm sorry, there's a lot of stuff going on in spring. It won't be this way all year long, but I wanted to get through a lot of that. Um, this is where we're going in terms of our agenda for upcoming months. So if you have an app that you would like, in April we're going to do Demolicious. So people can submit, this is something that the PDX Web Innovators has been doing for a while. So mobile apps, submit them if they're cool. I'm not actually sure what the judging criteria is going to be on what, who gets to present, but they're going to try to pick really interesting projects. And then next month we'll be looking at those projects and, and um, I think critiquing them. We may even try to get judges or something like that to provide feedback. Um, in May, I'm going to try to get one of the speakers who's coming in from the East Coast uh, to come speak to us, who are coming in for Web Visions. And then we're going to do Mobile Health and you see the rest of them. OK, um, just briefly, if anyone has job openings um, or mobile-related announcements that they'd like to uh, alert out, um, yeah. that we have a job opening for a product manager of mobile applications. So it's uh, mobile and payments. And you can go to trustvesta.com or stop by afterwards. That's just been doing mobile stuff for quite some time. So it's like a skin gem for the area. Kale Bruckner, Concentric Sky. We're down in Eugene. I um, <clears throat> have a few open positions. iOS developer, Android developer, Python. Developer camera references. <laughs> <laughs> Careers at concentricsky.com. The obligatory. The obligatory. Uh, Urban Airship is hiring for Android and iOS developers, uh, inside sales account manager, and if you're so inclined, a VP of finance as well. <laughs> And then afterwards, we'll, we'll take questions for Rennie and Marcelino. So uh, Marcelino works at Uncork Studios. He used to work at uh, White and Kennedy. So the, um, <laughs> well, the Chalk Block project is uh, something that he was also involved with. Um, but uh, what was it, like a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, something, all of a sudden, uh, the activity on the other side, so Uncork Studios is in the building with us and Urban Airship, uh, suddenly got a little strange. Um, there was a lot of chatter going on, a lot of meetings, and a lot of um, sort of long hours. And we wondered what was going on. And um, sooner or later, out came this project called Radiation.org, which is about trying to track radiation um, in Japan. 
mediation levels. Um, and Marcelina will tell you a little bit more about that. But it's been really fun to watch the people in the organization sort of um, realize the responsibility associated with providing this information and, and begin to learn more about it. Um, and also the sort of really fun things that they're now bringing into the office, like the eBay purchased Geiger counter from the former Soviet Union or <laughs> Russia. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm sure that we're going to have some really interesting stuff here. And their project has, like, the project itself is just the beginning of the journey as opposed to the end of the journey, which I think is the most interesting part of it. And are you ready? All right. Marceline. Uh, it seemed like something that was well beyond our reach. 
uh, until I saw this photo on someone's Facebook wall, uh, which kind of became, be, began an investigative process uh, whereby I spent countless hours researching uh, what a rat was. Uh, and, and it's not, it's not a, a social term used by surfers in California. Um, it, it's a radioactive dose, uh, something or the other. And that was really scary uh, to me. So I tuned into the news, I, you know, I searched on Twitter, I wanted to see what other people were saying about this, and Anderson Cooper was already there, like he left Egypt, and he was already in Japan, which I thought was really great. Uh, Sanjay Gupta was uh, showing his dosimeter, you can't really see it there, but his dosimeter would say, this is my radiation level. Uh, and then he had uh, doctors and, and physicists kind of getting on the news saying, we don't have a lot of information. Uh, and so there was kind of a, a frustrating point for me, you know, between this saying we're all gonna die. Uh, and this, you know, they're just, they're out there, they're reporting, they're doing their thing. So this is what I did, uh, which is <laughs> to start preparing myself uh, for the nuclear apocalypse. I, um, I bought an Israeli gas mask, which believe it or not, you can buy at amazon.com. They come with these little NBC things that are nuclear biological and chemical filters. Um, I bought uh, this other, uh, kind of like decal that you can stick on your license that tells you like how much radioactivity you're exposed to over time. And then uh, the actual Geiger counter is really difficult to come by because other nut jobs such as myself were buying them all for themselves. <laughs> um, and so this guy, which actually arrived today, is sitting over there. If anyone wants to see it, uh, you're welcome to. Uh, I bought from a website called SovietPower.net, and uh, it's, an actual, it's an actual Soviet era Geiger counter. Um, I know that some of the, the Cloud 4 office mates uh, expressed concern that it may have been used in Chernobyl and if such, it might be radioactive. Um, the decal on the left, when put next to the Geiger counter, says otherwise, so we'll see. But then I, I, then I kind of started realizing that this is perhaps a little paranoid. Uh, and so one afternoon, a uh, week ago, Two weeks ago, Wednesday, uh, I was working from home, again, watching Anderson Cooper and everyone kind of go through their spiel. Uh, and, and I heard a scientist uh, finally say the most educated thing that I'd seen anyone say, which was, we actually don't have enough data to make an educated point. There's, there's not enough going on here that, that really allows us to draw any sort of conclusion about what's going on. Uh, and, and that actually sat with me, you know, instead of doing this, that perhaps there was something that our company could do that would actually be more productive. Uh, so I ripped out a sheet of paper uh, from my notebook, uh, and I can't draw for anything. Um, and, I, and I drew this, and, and yes, that is my attempt at Japan. Um, <laughs> and there's a little radiation.org kind of uh, up there in the upper left-hand corner. And so I wonder what would happen if we actually um, built a site, just something where there could be data and invite scientists and people who know a lot more than us, uh, not the Anderson Coopers of the world, uh, to actually comment on this thing. Like, what if we invited people uh, to look at the data and say, here's, here's information that is being put forth by either official government ministries or people who have access to Geiger counters or people with uh, a lot more information than we do. Uh, and then invite those people to go on the TV shows and say, well, based on the trends that we're seeing, you actually don't need to be buying uh, any of these things. Uh, and so I sent this over to, to David uh, Ewald, who's our creative director, and it was more of a, a gut check on my extreme uh, sense of paranoia, and I asked him, hey, what do you, what do you think about this? And he said, cool, uh, I think this is actually pretty neat. Uh, and about eight hours later, um, we had a, a design that kind of showed pins on a map. Uh, you can't kind of see here, but uh, it showed pins on a map, uh, had like latest readings, and uh, we're like, cool, this is pretty neat. So the next morning, this was Thursday, uh, you know, Thursday, and we said, you know, sat down with our developers uh, and said, hey, what do you guys think about this? Like, is this something we could get up by tomorrow? Uh, they said no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which, was, which was fine. It was, it was an expected answer. Uh, but we sat down with them, we talked it through, we, we, broke, we broke this apart and said, you know, but let's get this up. And, and 72 hours later, uh, we actually uh, launched this site that you see here. Uh, the, the interesting thing, uh, kind of a, a side note back to our product uh, versus uh, advertising background. Uh, our director of product development, John, who's sitting here, was actually gone on vacation for uh, a week uh, while this was all happening. And uh, he made a promise that we wouldn't sink the company uh, 
while, while he was gone uh, by doing some sort of weird advertising kind of thing. And um, this isn't an advertising kind of thing, but I think in the back of both David and in my mind, like, all right, if John were here, he would be saying, I'm not so sure about this. Uh, so like, make it quick, make it awesome, and, and just you know, get it out there. And so we were kind of channeling our inner John throughout this. And actually, what I want to show you is how we channeled uh, our inner John. Um, so how do we do this in, in 72 hours? Well, uh, we made assumptions, uh, quite a few actually. Some we knew we were making and others we did not. Uh, we also built a trust network. This isn't something that we intended to do. Uh, we just reached out to a few people that we knew and asked them some questions and really quickly this network kind of came from it. Uh, and then, uh, this is kind of the Google mentality, we launched really early. Uh, probably too early, uh, and we iterated often uh, on top of that, uh, which was really kind of neat uh, because our product got out there, it got some responses, uh, we realized there were a couple of errors, we fixed those, and uh, we kept kind of going. So the assumptions, uh, the first one, uh, we assumed that people would actually buy Geiger counters. <laughs> uh, we also assumed that people would trust us. Uh, we kind of knew this going in, but we weren't really sure to what degree of trust and how quickly uh, we could get it, but, but it was, it was an important assumption to make. Uh, we also assumed that radiation units are simple, uh, and <laughs> that was one of the ones that we didn't realize uh, we were assuming uh, they're not. Um, we also assumed that people would understand what we were displaying. Uh, you know, we have these pins on a map, they're colored, there's data, we're set. Uh, that was false. Um, and then we also assumed that no one else was trying to solve this very exact same problem. Uh, and fortunately, through the, the trust network, we actually found the people who were, in fact, further along or trying to solve the same problem, and we got connected to those people. Uh, and finally, uh, we assumed that we were qualified to do this. <laughs> we, we aren't astrophysicists. I, uh, I took physics in college, that was about it. I, it's, it's not our area of specialty. And, one of the things that we realized once we launched this is that people were actually looking to us for this expert advice. Uh, and so we, we realized it was a, a big magnitude uh, of kind of trust placed upon our church. So uh, the second point, we built a trust network. And a little corollary I came up with actually to kind of explain how you build a trust network uh, in a time of crisis. Uh, if person A trusts person B and person B trusts person C, uh, then upon a mutual introduction by person B, persons A and C will trust each other. Now note that this is in a time of crisis. Uh, outside of a crisis, the way that it works is, uh, if person A trusts person B and person B trusts person C, then upon a mutual introduction, they actually will spend weeks trying to figure out if they trust each other. And that's why nothing normally gets done. But we were in a crisis, and people were actually really incredibly helpful. They dropped everything. They said, you know what? This person vouches for you. We're going to keep moving forward. Uh, and that was kind of neat. Uh, I actually have a, a little visual of this, and this is actually what I'm calling right now like the brain trust for radiation.org. It doesn't actually include all the people that sit near the people that are going to be dropped onto this map. So there are people who have helped us that aren't here, but this is kind of part of like our Skype chats at like 6 in the morning uh, and at 6 in the evening. So there's David and myself, uh, sort of in Portland. And we reached out to Serge uh, and Rick to Rosie about, you know, hey, who, who do we know here in this town that can help us out with this? We're building this thing with like Macomb. They're like, oh, that's really cool. Uh, so Serge actually connected us to a friend in North Carolina named Aaron. And Aaron's like, yes, this is awesome. I know some people that have actually already taken uh, certain steps uh, to figure out the notion of building a platform of sensors and monitoring sensors and whatnot. So he actually connected us to a company called Patch Bay. Oops. He actually connected us to a guy named Joy. Uh, Ito, who was at the time in Dubai, and I think he might be somewhere between Frankfurt and Japan right now. Uh, yes? He lives in Dubai, but he's not in Dubai right now. Uh, but he was in Dubai with Virgin. Uh, and Joy connected us to Sean Bonner, uh, who is a hacker slash park guy uh, in LA, works with Joy. Uh, Joy also introduced us to this guy, Peter Franken, who is a Dutch journalist. Uh, who is living in Tokyo and has a lot of family out there. Uh, Aaron also connected us to Ed Borden, who's biz dev director for Patch Bay, uh, which is spelled Pachubi, and in the midst of all this was actually kind of a fun thing because we kept mispronouncing.
not saying it, so we wrote it, Pachubi equals patch bit. Uh, and Pachubi is actually a network of um, device reading stations. They take all the data, they help you scale it up, uh, and they essentially have everything we were trying to do. Uh, and I would say that probably in any normal other project, like if this was like our biz dev idea, we'd say, we're done. These guys have already done it. Um, but we were halfway through our like 40 hour dev cycle, so we just kind of kept going. Um, but Ed connected us to their CEO, Usman, uh, in London, and Usman offered us like free white label uh, access to all their data, and they were also trying to compile data for radiation detection devices. So that actually instantly became one of the most credible sources of data that we had. Um, Yes, um, and then uh, Joy kind of became this, you know, middle hub to a few other people. So he's, you know, connecting us to Bunny Huang, who was the inventor of the Chumbi, uh, which played a role in a previous lifetime uh, of building weird little computing stuff. So if anyone wants to see what a Chumbi looks like, I've got one on my desk. Uh, and also connected us to this guy Dan Seif, who happened to be the CEO of the company that we were linking to on our website already. Uh, as a source of Geiger counters. Uh, he runs International Medcom and has worked at pretty much every nuclear crisis uh, from Three Mile Island to Chernobyl. Uh, and his lifelong vision has been to build a network of independent nuclear testing devices that could help uh, in times of crisis, which is kind of where we wanted to go with this. So this kind of became our brain trust, and this happened probably in a matter of hours. I mean, I would say we sent this to Surge, and then within eight hours, we're connected to half these people, and then within another eight hours, we're connected with the other half, and since then, we've been Skyping, uh, and whatnot. So, Trust Network, uh, amazing. Don't know if I could ever reproduce that if I tried. Um, oops. And then, this guy suddenly got added uh, onto our, uh, our diagram and, and onto our Skype group, but he's the director, producer of the code, and is a videographer and a director in Tokyo, and they suddenly involved with us, so I'm guessing Joy has bigger ideas than, I don't know if you have um, Then launching early. So 72 hours after the initial sketch, we launched the first version of radiation.org. Uh, this was David Ewald, you can't read it because I didn't like it very long. This was David Ewald's first sketch. Uh, and this is what we launched with. Um, you'll notice, uh, those astute people in the audience, that I'm missing the word nano in front of grays per hour, so one of the first pieces of feedback that we got is, is Tokyo on fire. <laughs> uh, which a corollary to launching early uh, is fixed bugs, is even bigger. Uh, so that's the word nano, we fixed that quickly. Um, and then uh, Sean Bonner, who would be, we had been connected to, is also a contributor to Boing Boing. And so before we even sent out a press release, and we had one drafted in our Google Doc, we're like, we're doing this thing, we don't know what it is. Uh, Sean wrote this article and put it up on Boing Boing. This was Saturday night, uh, I was at a dinner party, uh, and our site crashed right after that uh, because it was sending so much traffic uh, to our website, which, you know, having seen the social network recently, I thought was kind of cool, but then realized that people were depending on us for data, so we still love it fix that as well. Uh, and then we iterated off, and this is actually going to be kind of painful, you can't see what we're doing here. Um, we added, oh. sorry, it's still 72 hours after sketch, uh, and then we started iterating by adding a Japanese version of our website, uh, completely crowdsourced to translations to three different people, some x y contacts, uh, some other folks that they introduced us to, and some of Joyce friends. Uh, and we had not only a Japanese translated website, but it was approved twice, uh, which was kind of awesome because the English one was approved twice. <laughs> um, <laughs> we also added uh, a planned update section, uh, which was kind of our roadmap. We realized the word roadmap was not actually friendly to people who work in the tech industry. So uh, we called it planned updates. We said, you know what, we know we want to do like more analysis and data visualization, and we want to add more data feeds, and we want to invite people to contribute and, and, and talk to us and let us know you know, what the data means, uh, but we can only get to so much. So we optimized the site uh, to work on mobile devices, uh, which is great because it's a mobile talk, so it works on your iPhone, uh, but not your iPhone 3G. Um, and we launched a blog to kind of explain what we were doing, uh, and I've continued to iterate uh, since. And we have a laundry list of things that we want to do, uh, but I thought I'd shed a little bit of light on some of the things that we're talking about right now that don't exist uh, on the website. Uh, and kind of explain you know, what it is that we're doing. Uh, one of the things that we want to do is iterate a little bit more. Uh, we obviously have some things that we want to do on our site, both with our data feeds, migrating to Patch Bay. Uh, Patch Bay actually syncs with uh, Yushahidi, 
uh, which is another company that Rennie mentioned. So in terms of being able to get more reliable data on the field, having the ability to do so with feature phones is super important. Um, we also started having this conversation which seemed kind of completely uh, ahead of its time for what we were doing. We just launched the website, but now we're talking about building hardware. Uh, but this conversation is actually incredibly picking up steam, and we actually <coughs> have some designs for some hardware. Uh, we make software, so we want to make sure that we can actually take the notion of some of this web-based platform and potentially bring it uh, to an iPhone or an Android device and actually have nuclear detection devices that uh, will either spit a Geiger counter feed into your iPhone with headphone jack so you can actually count things for uh, And then an ecosystem, so how this all kind of plays together. Uh, and so I think David and I are probably the most self-critical people, at least that I know, and so I think we're moving slow sometimes, and, and I have to take a step back to realize that we're not, but for, the, for a couple of days, it seemed like we're moving slow with the site, and all these conversations were happening, and it made you feel a little bit better about some of the other things. So, more iterations. Um, a third of our traffic is from Germany, so we launched uh, a German website today, which is great. Uh, one of our developers, Sean, actually pulled some connections with his sister, and we got us uh, some German translations. Uh, which is pretty awesome. Uh, so now we're literally uh, in the three languages that represent uh, close to a third of our traffic. Uh, and this is kind of unfortunate, you can't see here. But uh, this is a uh, design that Bunny did uh, for what the actual radiation detection device might look like, with a little radiation.org logo on top of it. Um, but really, it's got an internal battery pack, it's got a headphone jack so that you can connect it to uh, devices, a USB po uh, port uh, for added charging or uh, for connection to other devices in a little LED mode. And the notion is that there'd be like a core device, but there'd be all these other ancillary devices that could connect to it, either a GPS module or a GSM module that would actually upload data into the cloud. Um, we're actually going to be going to Tokyo next month and have a conference on how we're going to build this thing, which is uh, completely crazy. Um, and then we set up a wiki, because all these people are literally in eight different time zones. And so uh, we have offline conversations, we have online conversations, we have Skype audio conferences that sometimes we do video conferences uh, without you knowing because Skype has a bug that when one person connects and they have Skype Pro, they automatically throws everyone else into the conference into video chat, which is great unless you're uh, working from home at 6 a.m. here in your <laughs> And so this is the, uh, the system architecture for how everything might actually start playing together. So that core module on the far left is actually kind of what we had to design for. But then there's different interfaces that uh, it would inter interact with. So either feature phones, uh, to Reddy's point about feature phones being uh, probably the majority of phones that are out there compared to the smartphones like the iPhone and the Android. Uh, but selfishly, we build stuff for iPhone and Android, so we want to make sure that we address those as well. Uh, and then potentially, you know, different interfaces, whether it be a laptop on um, the field, an Arduino, or a Chumbi, or some other, you know, kind of connected device, uh, or potentially a larger uh, kind of standard <coughs> monitoring station that might be more accessible to universities and scientists. Uh, and then there's a web service layer, which currently says radiation database, but actually we'll probably be migrating that all to patch bay. Uh, we would be building stuff that sits on top of it, and then there's this usable uh, user visible data. Uh, and so we learned a few things, uh, kind of in the, in the process of, of building this site, uh, which today will be 10 days old. Uh, one, I would say that in normal circumstances, we actually talk ourselves out of action. Uh, if this was a project that was either for a client or for ourselves or something that we wanted to, to just do, um, I would say that the presence of a large software company that had already done it, um, or uh, 18 other people from kids in college in Germany to uh, you know, folks you know, that work at IDEO in London to whomever, at having already built something similar or doing mashups, we probably would have stopped right there and said, you know what, it's been done, we can't really add value from here. Um, other thing, times of crisis allow people to build trust more quickly and that leads to quicker action. I think if this was also a normal kind of you know, paying project or client project, we probably would have sat there and tried to evaluate well, what, are, what are these person's motivations? Why do they want to help us? Why is this guy in Dubai talking to me right now? I don't understand. Uh, you know, why are we getting on these Skype calls? Why, are, why is there so much energy and, and belief in this if it has failed so many times before? 
Uh, and the fact is, is that people kind of throw down their barriers when, when there's a big crisis and, and, and a willingness to kind of put aside the normal uh, preconceptions that we have. Um, mistakes happen. Uh, the key is to admit them and correct them very quickly and not to uh, make them again. Uh, I think the thing we learned with units is that units are very important and even though the data feed is giving you a certain value, don't assume that it's going to display perfectly on the site, especially if people are actually going through and clicking every pin and they think that something is a thousand times uh, higher. Um, and, and you know what? We, we fixed that and now are extremely sensitive to the, the data values that are coming in. Uh, and you know, ours is off by magnitude of a thousand. Uh, Tepco's is probably off by a magnitude of a million on Saturday, so I feel a little bit better. Um, and then really, we, we kind of caught lightning in a bottle. Uh, we don't know where it's going to go. Uh, we're kind of hanging on and hoping that we can keep this as long as it can. We hope that uh, the normal circumstances don't return. We hope that while the crisis subsides, that the trust that we've built with people continues. Uh, and then we hope that we make less mistakes, but as we make them, and we will, uh, that we correct them uh, and are as transparent and upstanding about them so that people who are using our site uh, can continue to, to trust us. Thank you. Any questions? No? No questions. <laughs> So the question is, is that with the nuclear crisis happening every 5, 10, or 15 years, how do you design a product that can potentially uh, serve as a bridge from one incident to another? Uh, and I would say, you know, first off, I think that's one of the normal things that you would use to kind of talk yourself out of building a product is like, well, this is going to be obsolete really quickly because the technology is changing. Uh, the thing that we've learned in, in being on the phone uh, with people who make Geiger counters and people who make uh, the devices that test them is that the actual technology that's used to detect radiation, the actual sensors themselves, actually kind of remains the same. It is two inch pancake uh, tablets, uh, is what they're called. Uh, and so, really, the sensors and the detection devices that kind of sit around that is probably what would change. Um, you know, much like any device, I think maybe the feature phone is potentially an example. There are ways to deliver a product that kind of hits a certain base level that doesn't miss, maybe need all the bells and whistles uh, over time. So something that at least can, can send a snippet of data, uh, so long as it can record a few of the different radiation values or attempt to detect uh, what uh, isotopes are in the air, would probably suffice for most things. Uh, that's not to say that the devices themselves would, you know, would last five to 10 years. Um, we've also learned that ANSI requires uh, that the devices be calibrated once a year. So at minimum, these devices that we'd be sending out uh, would need to be calibrated once a year and potentially you know, have any updates. Uh, the other thing we're looking at with the GSM chips is that potentially being able to deliver uh, firmware updates via patch bay going the other way uh, to some of the devices that we put out. In the back. So that first slide you showed that I still have the person to ask for the actual. <laughs> we're working on adding a chart of like what the values mean okay. with regard to what's actually measured out. Because it was scary enough. Sure, no, that's, so there's a really awesome, if you haven't seen it yet, uh, XKCD has the most amazing infographic on should I be worried, uh, we'll probably link to it at some point. Um, but it basically puts that into scale in a way that I don't think any of us could ever do. It's, it's perfect, so just check that out. Um, with regards to, to the cloud, I think the thing that I realized was that uh, in the effort of buying Geiger counter and small, you know, little detection devices. What I was actually doing was creating uh, an unnecessary demand for product that needed to be in Japan. 
Um, so while my Geiger counter is completely outdated, there were people who were literally buying civilian grade uh, Geiger counters, and I'll be the first to admit that if I clicked there first, it probably would have been me. Um, we don't need that here. Uh, I think what we do need here, though, are you know people who are going to get involved either at the uh, local and city levels to encourage our governments uh, and organizations such as hospitals and, and universities to make their data uh, available in a feed that makes sense. Uh, I think it's been ridiculously frustrating to be able to, well, it's been amazing to be able to get data from the Ministry of Science in Japan, uh, even though they export it as a PDF and there are people uh, who have crowdsourced the pasting of data from that PDF into a Google Doc that then is being taken by another guy, Marion Steinbach. Uh, and making that into a CSV file, and having that be a much more easier process to get data than going to EPA.gov. Uh, you know, if anyone out here has any contacts to the EPA, uh, please feel free to pass them along. We, we email them and uh, Dr. wrote us back and say, uh, we don't let you know where the devices are for national security reasons, and no, we don't make it extensible. Um, so I, I don't feel great right now with the current radiation levels based on what we're seeing. Uh, but certainly, you know, anything could happen that's kind of beyond uh, what we're talking about. We can change it, but for now, we want. Got two questions. Have you considered open sourcing your software? And second, was for any, given your obvious contempt for uh, brands, government, things like that, how do you balance the job you do against certain <laughs> demand for that? <laughs> source platform. And so one of the things we've talked about is actually moving all the data uh, to PatchBank so that it's available to everyone else. Uh, the thing that we've realized is that when you're capturing, uh, I don't know, pretty points are now showing like a couple thousand, probably an hour, um, that actually making that into a form that's digestible is not easy, but, but it is in our roadmap. Uh, I think the thing that is, um, and we haven't totally figured it out yet because we don't know what sort of legal entity radiation.org will take. Uh, is what portion of the IP will fall within an open source realm or versus a for profit realm. That being said, we want the data to be open source. We just haven't figured out. I, apparently, setting up a nonprofit is not an easier thing. Um, so, we're, we're also uh, learning about that. So, yes, we talk about And I don't hold brands in contempt. <laughs> Streaming friends on the web. <laughs> um, I, I do think a, a significant amount of the advertising out there is crap. And I think that brands have an opportunity to, and a platform that may not always have the will, but they have the platform to actually change some, and impact more lives more quickly than a lot of ways that we could uh, go out. Do. They built the infrastructure. They have the trust. Um, I just love the notion of being able to. The, the thing that inspires me is the opportunity to use that to do really interesting things. Maybe a little different than what folks have hoped for, but that hopefully mean their objectives, but are also fucking awesome. So that's that's only for me. Did I sufficiently skirt the question? <laughs> I mean, answer it. I was curious. Yeah, but that is true. I, I, I don't want it to sound like I'm contentious of them because they can really do amazing stuff. Will you guys post a slides up to local media or something? Will slideshows be posted? Well, everybody needs to know. Sure. <laughs> I probably need to check on two slides, but yeah. yes. That's, that's why I was. Hello, streaming friends. <laughs> that's that's why uh, a lot of the stuff in there. That's it, it, it's one of those inherent sort of conflicts. Like I like to look at a group of people like this and be able to have a conversation with them that maybe we couldn't have sort of largely. So I just have to look at some of those to make sure what I'm talking about. That's a yes. You know, little bit of flavor. <laughs> Mostly. <laughs> So, so I see a really interesting
interesting inherent gap between the two you stand in for me. It's wooden. It's, it's true. true. It doesn't it's have It's not the it. bone gap. That's a whole different thing. No. So we have Mars and his team who did an amazing thing. And I actually find it really funny that you were relying on a second voice telling you to keep things, to not tank the company, because I knew you were an amazing producer who was all about being practical and, and that plug was paid for, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but but the thing is, you put you put what was probably you know billable business building on hold to do something really amazing for the world, and I really admire that as somebody who's also trying to do the crazy small business thing. And it's really hard to know where your resources lie, right? But you did something amazing that changes the world. And then we have an amazing communicator who gets that brands can be something different and amazing and that they have resources, which is the one thing that the small business world changers in the world don't have. But I still, I feel like there's a Should challenge. I stand closer to Yes, please. I want you to hold hands and like, <laughs> 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 Where's the Coke? I want the Coke and the Diet Coke together. Yeah. No, but, but talk to me a little bit about um, the connection building that needs to be done between people with great ideas and brands who can support great ideas, and how. Do you have something to announce? Because that'd be awesome. Like a connection. <laughs> <laughs> but but the one thing I want to know too, and this is especially for you, Renny, is how connected does the greater good idea need to be connected to the big idea in the advertising sense? How direct does that connection need to be? And I know, Mars, you probably have some interesting ideas in this, too. Um, or, or can they be separate and just, you talk about the good stuff, sorry. <laughs> Where's the radiation counter that runs on this? I'm sure Coke will go for that. It's right there for So. Sorry. And the cool thing was that we actually both got to share an example of something that bridged those two worlds, which was the top bot execution. And in that particular case, what happened was the challenge was actually a really noble one that we were handed by by the client. And you know, I, I think well, not good. I mean, that was that was Mars and Co. Um, but I think everybody who touched that was pretty inspired by. Not only what it could be from kind of a holy shit, this is cool technology, but the there was a there was a fascinating sort of response. I think we got something like thirty six thousand messages that in, in the first time. It was like, oh, thirty six thousand messages. Well, that must be must be a failure. It's like thirty six thousand messages from people in a community that have been stricken or dealing with cancer. It's a pretty substantial number of folks and. In that particular case, we had a platform that wasn't just an advertising vehicle, it was actually adopted by that community in a really interesting way that we hadn't really probably expected when we rolled out. But I will let you talk about that. But that to me, or was it a, and then I will But that's a product with a direct connection. Really that's strong. Right. It's about living healthy, right? So that's easier than She's not Coke. Healthy, healthy, healthy. No. Well, I'll, 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 I'll be here. Okay. <laughs> But I would argue that Livestraw uh, and Nike at times would still look at that brief and say, give us a TV commercial. And, and you know, build us a robot wasn't part of the brief, and it took the yeah. insurmountable effort by Jeremy Lind and Adam and James to like literally keep beating that over the head. It's like, no, this is going to stay in that presentation deck forever. And it took a client who believed in it yep. to actually prove it. And it was its own other lightning in the bottle. And yes, an example of what happens when brands can come together and actually say, here's the brief. Um, but I'm gonna take a quick turn south for just a second. Uh, this is not, this message is not endorsed by Rennie. Um, I would have argued that if we would have launched the website with corporate logos on it, that it would have lost a sense of credibility in the initial going, you know, um, not necessarily like a brand that was shown here because all those brands are great. Um, but potentially any other brand on there might have actually diminished the value of what we were trying to create, which was we're not an activist organization, we're not scientists, we're just putting in data. And one of the things that we've been working on, is still not on the site, is that level of scientific analysis that says, you know, this is what this means, this is what this means. But going back to brands, 
um, the notion of you know a Google.org or a Nike Foundation, you know, looking at the nonprofit and the you know kind of sustainability or the kind of corporate responsibility wings of a lot of those brands, they actually have you know budgets that are either allocated to efforts that are you know, sort of positive and endearing and finding ways to do that that don't necessarily conflict with the we need to sell shoes or we need to sell retail stuff uh, that are focused on you know putting their logo on things that make sense. Uh, and to that end, I think that more often than not, either those subsections of brands aren't ever working with the top-notch creative talent that they are, and then when they do, what they end up settling for is a TV commercial um, versus actually doing something that's a product. So it can happen, but it just the brief isn't always there. And just to, to build on that, the, the brief was, what's the TV spot? And Marcelino and Co. fought through the line that that was not going to be the best way to do it. It was a commercial spot to say, go, go Lance. And they fought for something that, and found a client who, who believed in it to, to carry it through the line. I guess the, the, the challenge we've got is not just in the mobile space, in the interactive space, is, is convincing brands and the folks who are making decisions at those brands that advertising isn't necessarily the most effective communication vehicle that they have. And that if we can do something really interesting that touches people's lives and creates connections with them, that that's an equally valid, if not more important, way that we can communicate. And the wonderful thing about technology is that we've got that possibility right now. And that's the thing for me about mobile is just that that's what's in everybody's pocket. And sweet gravy, mother of God, if, if this room of individuals who are working in mobile can't come up with something better than a chiclet sized crap banner fed into that device in your pocket as the most effective way a brand can communicate with you, then no one will. This is the group that can do that. That's so let, let's do it. So, like one more question and then we should wrap up. Or maybe two. I guess two and answer up. Two questions. No. I, Brandon, I'm just really curious how you deal with this kind of counterintuitive approach. I mean, what you're saying is that the, the value really is in the giving, the value is in the solving, the value is in the inspiration, and the value is in the connections. And you're dealing with people who live in a paradigm where, you know, how do we get as much as we can get for what we invest in? We can get money on the TV show, how many eyeballs will see it, how does it calculate, what's the old paradigm? So how, I, I'm really curious, how, how do you on a, on, a, on a gremlin, how do you reconcile that when you're in these meetings with these decision makers with something that's, for them, so they don't have access to reconcile that counterintuitive message that you're giving them. It's, it, it, that's, it, that's a great question. The question was, how do we reconcile the ability to, to change the notion of value in communication with many brands' desire to see value in the form of ROI on their right. ad spend? That's another good question. Yep. Uh, that's that's the trench warfare that's going on right now. Um, the a couple of years back, the conversation was engagement, right? When, when in the mobile, in, in, not in the mobile space, in the, in the broad interactive space, the whole thing was we we gone and sold ourselves up the river by creating CDMs, which was just dumb. Like really, have magazines, but that's been the hangover that we've had to deal with for quite a while. And it's it's somewhat supported by the fact that most brands have now separated media buying from advertising and creative. And so it's it, it, you often have different people who own those respective things. And the person who owns it has the budget for it. And so whoever owns the media relationship is focused on media efficiency and ROI. And whoever owns the creative side is really interested in having an inspirational you know, sort of thing happen. And uh, we've been fortunate in that several of the clients we have, we actually do the media and the creative for them. So if anybody saw the Old Spice campaign with the, uh, the man your man can smell like, that came because those two sat in the same room and were able to have a conversation about the value that those conversations would have because of the media. Um, but that's an unusual situation, but one that we, uh, that's one we struggle with every day. We don't, we don't have the answer for it. That those are the conversations we're having. Is that the value that you can create? Value is, is a nebulous thing, and if we're trying to help people migrate beyond media efficiency, is the value that brands will get.
will, will not sacrifice anyone for each. Um, so, if it's if, I know that our cards weigh a lot, so I'm not. 
Okay. All right, excellent. Um, so thank you all very, very much for coming. We'll be here on the fourth Monday of next month uh, with demos. And thank you to our speakers. And everybody have a great night.